Boy, it sounds very official. <laughs> and good morning again, everyone. My name is Tim Woodrow. I'm the Township Engineer appointed by the Board of Commissioners to help uh, deal with land development, stormwater, infrastructure improvement issues. Um, as as B pointed out, uh, I think this is not as much as a conversation. And we kind of thought we'd start the conversation with a little bit of background information. You know, how we got to where we are today, I think is important. And so welcome to our stormwater coffee house. Um, again, be introduced, he and I as the commissioners, we're gonna be host this morning. And again, feel free to ask any questions as they may arise as, as we go through the presentation. I like to start with a conversation where we want to be. You know, this is the water course that we would all love to see and be near. It's of dense vegetation on the stream banks or riparian corridor, we like to say, kind of a rock bottom, crystal clear water running through. And I guess if you can imagine that in a, in a very severe storm event, if the water were to rise in this stream, it would have very little impact on public health, safety and welfare. I mean, it's gonna spread over a bank, it's going to be in the woods, it's going to rise, it's going to recede, and you know, really not a problem. But today, all too often, we have conditions um, eroded vertical stream bank. Every time it rains, more and more silt and sediment are carved out of the side of that embankment. That sediment is deposited downstream. And you know, why? How come we went from conditions that look like that to conditions that look like this? It's part of why we're having this conversation this morning. How do we fix some of these problems? But starting from, let's set the table. You know, wh wh how do we get here today? Um, their stormwater hit is long and storied. We're sitting here today in 2023. Probably these problems started before 1900. And the problems have continued to evolve ever since. So let's talk about how we got here. Some terms, maybe, before we get too far into it. Uh, when we talk about stormwater runoff, we talk a lot about watershed. What's a watershed? Well, here's the biggest example of a watershed. This is the Continental Divide at Loveland Path, Colorado. So water that falls on the east side of that sign drains to the Atlantic. Rain that falls on the west side of that sign drains to the Pacific. So that's a giant watershed. but we define runoff based upon watershed. And so our local Wissahickon Creek watershed looks something like this. So we've got communities, you know, Upper Gwinnett and Lansdale and Lower Gwinnett, and Upper Dublin and Whitpain and White Marsh and Springfield. All, any water that falls in this kind of white area in this map, all drains to the Wissahickon Creek. And we can measure the size of the watershed, we can measure or predict stormwater flows in each of the little tributaries that are contributory to the major branch of the Wissahickon before it enters the Schuylkill. But kind of watershed, you know, where is the water from that drains to the Wissahickon? Where does the water come from that drains to Paperville Road? Where does the water come from that drains through my backyard? And how large is that watershed is one of the, you know, one of the key factors for and think about when we're dealing with stormwater runoff and stormwater management. So all of this runoff, where does it come from? You know, it rains, it runs off our rooftops, it runs off our drive, it runs off our streets, it runs off our parking lots, it runs to the stream. You know, water kind of always runs downhill. So anything that is downhill from all of this kind of improvement in infrastructure eventually gets to our streams and water courses. And that's what we talk about runoff. We can talk about capture. So as this water is going places after the storm event, it's running down our driveways, it's running down our roads. And what we do is we capture that water in what we call inlets. So these inlets take water off the street, they take it and collect it, and gather it, and then it is piped away. So underground, there's a series of large diameter pipes that take this water and convey it someplace. Where that's conveyed is kind of one of the topics of conversation. Usually 
hits an outlet switch or someplace. So it goes, you know, from this big pipe and enters a stream or someone's backyard, it's going somewhere. So it then is discharged. So those are, are the kind of components that we have always kind of historically seen. We've got runoff, we've got capture, we've got conveyance, we've got discharge. So they kind of make up the initial components, if you will, for this uh, stormwater runoff that becomes a problem for us. And, and Tim, if I may. Sure, B. Um, you know, the, for Springfield Township, we do have a stormwater uh, sewer system that is owned and maintained by the township. Uh, so all the outlet structures you see here is a single stormwater sewer. Uh, there are other communities, the city of Philadelphia, for example, that have a combined sewer system where, you know, wastewater and stormwater are combined. I think that's a, an incredibly important distinction to make when we're talking about uh, storm systems. Our system is owned and maintained by the township and it's a dedicated uh, stormwater system. Absolutely, perfect. Um, and one of the other things we should be talking about this morning is, is floodplain. And what is a regulated floodplain and what's a non-regulated floodplain. But as far as uh, FEMA is concerned, as far as the Federal Flood Insurance Program is concerned, there are a series of maps that um, are produced by FEMA in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers that assess flood hazard. And so for Springfield Township, this is just one section of town, but this is flowing. Um, I think this is Bethel on Pike. I think this is the movie tavern. Um, and this is the wrap, whatever stream that is that comes through. Orland Mill Run, whatever stream. But certainly uh, you can see that these, uh, Stony Brook, thank you. Goodness gracious. Um, this blue highlighted area in the map is also accompanied by cross sections that have numbers associated with them. And so what FEMA says, if you are adjacent to this water course in a 100 year storm event, water is going to rise in theory to an elevation. That elevation is depicted on these cross sections. And so we know how to assess flood hazard and therefore flood insurance premium rates based upon how high this water is going to rise in these channels. And so that's we're talking about floodplain, the regulated floodplain. I should point out a more modern terminology instead of the 100 year storm event, FEMA is now using the term the 1% storm. So in any given year, there's a 1% chance that this intensity of storm water or rainfall is gonna occur. And so that is then the definition. As we've talked about the 100 year storm event, we've had a number of very intense storms that have exceeded that number. And so, you know, I think the 100 year event is kind of a misnomer and FEMA is changing their technology and suggesting that, well, okay, it's not a 100, it's a 1% chance. So on any given year, there's a 1% chance the water's gonna rise this high in that channel. And, and so we're talking about flood heights and flood impacts. This map doesn't describe what's happening on Fair Mill Road, what's happening in your backyard. It's not a regulated floodplain. This map is what we describe in our zoning ordinance and our floodplain conservation district regulation as the regulated floodplain. And we do have a full uh, floodplain map of the entire township uh, on the township website. So if you're ever curious, you know, if that creek in the backyard or if you property near you uh, is included in a floodplain, you're more than welcome to look that information up on our website. And just for your information, you know, any property that is in the floodplain, uh, whenever they come and do work, uh, your general rule of thumb is you're not allowed to build in the floodplain. You know, we don't like, you know, sheds that are in the floodplain because, you know, logic holds that, you know, in the instance of this 1% storm, uh, your, the shed that you put in the, your floodplain would be underwater and chances are it could be carried off uh, at some point. That's what the regulated means. Yes. That's what regulated means. Right. Yes, that's what regulated means is that when, if you ever put in a <clears throat> permit to put in, let's, for example, sheds, because sheds are super easy, uh, 
and we we will look and see if it's in the floodplain. And if it's in the floodplain, we will notify you that unless you get special exemption from the zoning board, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, and FEMA does not like any structures in the floodplain. And we do annual reports to FEMA uh, based on you know what's in the floodplain, what's not in the floodplain. So there's multiple levels of observation for what's in the floodplain. Great. So that's kind of a little bit of the background of, of where, we're, where we've been, what stormwater conversation is about. But one of the things that we're constantly struggling with and, and trying to deal with, I like to describe as sins of the past. You know, how did we arrive in 2023 with all of these continual stormwater conversations, the issues, the adverse impacts that that we're dealing with, you know, why is that? What were the sins of the past? And I like to use this illustration. In fact, I put it on the board. I think it's just because it's so clear. So, and this is on the city of Philadelphia's uh, water department website, but it shows in 1889, all the existing streams that were present in, in the city of Philadelphia. By the 1940s, that map, especially I'm looking here in the area uh, around the Wasaken and the streams, have all, all, they're all gone. You know, all those streams were contained in pipes. They were filled. They were, water courses were changed in direction. Um, so all of those natural streams that look for slide that was in the by the 1940s, they were all gone. And so trying to contain and enclose all these streams, you know, is probably a bad thing for the environment, probably a bad thing for a floodplain, probably a bad thing for stormwater runoff. And I'll point out that uh, there's still some streams in Northeast, but if you look at a map today of those streams, they're all gone too, you know, if they, Northeast Philadelphia developed well after the 1940s. And so, you know, they're gone. And so again, sins of the past, that's kind of, you know, where we've been. And Tim, just to kind of hit it home for the folks in the room and anyone who watches uh, later on, uh, the map of the Wissahickon that uh, Mr. Woodrow shared, uh, it showed that the headwaters where the creek starts is in Montgomery Township. Uh, does anyone want to venture a guess as to where Wissahickon Creek starts? Or let me rephrase, what's there now? <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner Wilson. Do you know what's there? I, I think it's the Montgomery County Wall. It is. So Montgomery Mall, it, underneath it, you know, Montgomery Mall was built on top of the headwaters of the Wissahickon. So, you know, that's just an example of, you know, of it's not just Philly, uh, you know, no. so it, it's a widespread issue. And, and in, historically, you know, the, the Second World War is over. It's the 1950s. Um, you know, soldiers are coming home. Everyone wants to go home expansion of the suburbs you know Levittown you know in the 1950s this is kind of what was happening at the Montgomery Mall it was happening through most of especially the inner ring suburbs at the time so Shelton Ham Springfield White Marsh Lower Moreland um, we're seeing kind of this type of development and you know if you take a you know, look at some of the historic pictures mm -hmm. oh Brady Bunch. I don't know what you guys are doing in 1970s, but I had a crush on Marsha Brady. I don't know if that means anything, but um, but certainly <laughs> during the 1970s, um, you know, if you look at Springfield, you know, how much of Springfield was developed, you know, in that 1970s kind of era, you know, here neighborhoods, you know, we had streets and sidewalks and homes being built. Um, Mulberry Road. I looked up at the tax map. So Mulberry was a 1960s vintage development. You know, again, curbs and sidewalks. 57, even better. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And and certainly in, in, in the 1960s and 70s, there was really nothing in play to deal with stormwater management. Very little to deal with collection and conveyance, but you know, we we're building these subdivisions. You know, here's Glenway Road, 1970s, and all looks very similar. A lot of big wide roads, a lot of rooftop, a lot of driveways, a lot of 
improvements to these properties over the years, you know, additions and patios and pools and sheds and all of this stuff is occurring during a time before stormwater management ordinances were in place. You know, um, any kind of technology didn't exist really with regard to uh, any of these kind of um, issues that we are facing today. People didn't pay attention. The important thing was to build homes, and, you know, provide housing. And the important thing was development. And, you know, how can we grow our community? And the effects of stormwater management were really not well informed. That being said, oh, I'm looking at Philadelphia. So this, I guess, is Ivy Hill Road. And you just look at the city of Philadelphia just across the border. And you can imagine what used to be streams and water courses and fields and woodlands and forests you know, completely covered by housetop and roadway. Not too dissimilar to, you know, what we did and probably, you know, if you look at Pleasant and, you know, Willow Grove Avenue and some of those older areas, certainly not the density you're seeing in the Philadelphia area, but some pretty dense development all done without regard for the stormwater runoff. And Tim, I think it's important to note that it was done without regard because one, there was not much of a knowledge base of these things. And two, and probably more importantly, uh, there were no rules and regulations in place to govern, you know, density and you know what can be built where yeah certainly zoning was in place but all of this work was done with you know full knowledge of zoning as far as size and road width that kind of you know control and criteria but there were really almost at this point anyway no regulations with regard to stormwater the goal was to get rid of it you know get it off my property and send it downstream someplace Again, that's what has been happening. And, and certainly the sins of the past are really issues that we are struggling with, you know, trying to solve today. So two kind of components of stormwater management that I like to differentiate. On one path is stormwater that's rising and running and, and poses a risk to public health and safety and and property. The other component, kind of environmental concerns, you know, what are we doing to the quality of our streams and water courses? How does adversely impacting our streams and water courses adversely impact, you know, the quality of life? And so two kind of branches, uh, and we'll deal with both of them a little bit today. So if we take a look at kind of these environmental impacts as, as, a, as a first step in the conversation, you know, what was kind of happening during that same time when a lot of suburban Philadelphia was being developed? There were other people who were a little more aware. You know, you had the whole 1960s movement of, you know, hey, they're paving paradise and putting up a parking lot. We certainly did that at the Montgomery Mall. We certainly did that in Ivy Hill Road in Philadelphia. And so there were people who were seeing that what we were doing not really working and that we really needed to find a better path forward. And so that kind of traded, you know, related into some, to some regulation. So in 1972, Congress adopted the Clean Water Act and there were regulations placed on a lot of pollutants. Certainly stormwater was one of the things or outfalls anyway, one of the things that was regulated by the Clean Water Act. And so we started doing things by the time the regulations took effect and kind of the late 80s, early 90s, we started building detention basins. And this is a kind of a 1990s vintage detention basin. It's off of Lime Kiln Pike in Upper Dublin Township. It exists today. It's one of my favorite examples of one of these early versions of a stormwater detention basin. I'll talk more about that, but if you look at what's happening here, concrete low flow channels, very well maintained turf lawns. Uh, and so just thinking out loud about what happens when stormwater runs off of roads and what happens when it hits a basin like this, worth talking about a little bit later. 
So after that 1972 Clean Water Act, a lot of regulations went in place that dealt with what we call point source pollution. You know, the pipes that came out of a factory and into a stream, pipes that came out of a sewage treatment plant, pipes that came out of, you know, many things, but point sources of pollution. You know, you had to clean the water before it left your, you know, your factory, you're producing plastics and whatever kind of pollutants came off of the process of the production of plastic had to be had to be treated. So it dealt initially EPA and then DEP um, dealt with these point sources of pollutant, point sources of discharge that uh, focused on regulations, you know, needed permits before you could discharge into a stream or a waterway from your factory. So point source is something that can be dealt with. Could, it can be measured very locally at the point of outfall and compliance kind of monitored point source. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tim, I think because uh, we're, we're in government, we throw letters out all the time for acronyms of oh, different departments. Uh, just for those watching or who will be watching and those in the audience, uh, when we're talking stormwater uh, above the local level of government, we're talking state and federal agencies, right? So at the state level for Pennsylvania, you have the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. You know, if we DEP, say DEP, DEP, that's the state level agency uh, that deals with environmental issues. And when we talk about the EPA, you know, for those who haven't heard, uh, that is the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So that's your federal level oversight. So you got the EPA on top, you got DEP, you know, in between, and then you got the locals you know, the township at the, the bottom. And your good point B, and obviously the federal regulation is adopted and then passed down to the states for enforcement. So for the vast majority of those rules and regulations that we're talking about, it's the state department of environmental protection that regulates issues, permits, finds violation uh, before it would go to a federal level kind of conversation. Yeah, EPA usually gets involved when someone's in trouble. <laughs> when someone's in big trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so point sources of pollution. Then we're talking, I like this slide, crabs versus Springfield Township. Um, and, and all has to deal with water quality and some of the obligations that Springfield Township faces because of crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. And so uh, talking about non-point sources of pollution. So we have talked about the point source of pollution where we have a pipe from a factory entering a stream. The non-point sources of pollution really deal with stormwater runoff. You know, we've got agricultural activities. <laughs> we've got car washing, you know, we've got a big one, lawn fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides that are applied to either crops or lawns. Um, salt, road cinders and road salts, uh, just general trash and debris that runs off, um, you know, of our parking lots. And you know, these are things that are polluting our waterways due to stormwater runoff. So non-point sources of pollution. So one of the things that happened after this initial Clean Water Act and point source pollution concerns were identified and regulated there was a lawsuit filed by Friends of the Chesapeake Bay. And they said to the EPA, hey, you guys are not enforcing certain provisions of the Clean Water Act. You're dealing well with our point sources of pollution, but you guys are doing nothing when it comes to regulating non-point sources of pollution. And so conversation goes back and forth and, and the Friends of the Chesapeake Bay, they, they won. And here they are. This is a 2010, um, I guess, memorandum from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, talking about the health of the bay. And you know, that's been a, an important factor of all these things. So by the time that lawsuit played out and by the time regulations were adopted, it wasn't until 2004 that we started dealing with regulations and ordinances that really identified more adequately what we were doing with stormwater runoff and how to better improve water quality and 
and, and, and the streams that are adjacent to us? How do we return as soon as possible to that idyllic image that was on the first slide of you know, the very naturalized watercourse with good repair and buffer and all those things? And we started talking about maybe three components of stormwater that we never talked about before. We talked about rate control in the 90s, but volume control and water quality improvements uh, are now part of the conversation. And in 2004, as an industry, as civil engineers and designers, and as regulators from DEP, um, there was not a lot of ability to understand completely um, how to deal with these things. And so we've been evolving you know, a, a great deal over time. Uh, Tim, I think it would be important, at least for everyone uh, listening in and here in the, in the audience today, uh, maybe if we explain a little bit as to why it's important to control the rate and to control the volume. Amen. So one of the things that um, has happened, so rate control, we've dealt with for a long time. So when you take a, a natural field or forest and you tear it all down and you build parking lots and roads and houses, the rate at which stormwater runs off increases significantly. And so this water rushes off of new parking lots, rushes into streams and causes the erosion and the stream bank issues that we saw in those initial slides. It also causes kind of a tremendous flooding impact on downstream properties where the rate of the flow is so high that it over pops banks and it's a very flashy kind of storm. It doesn't slowly meter through the channel, but it, it really blows up and you know floods things out. Um, so that's rate control. Volume control is important because once you pave something, the groundwater is not recharged. And so all the base flow in the streams uh, is diminished and our streams become very dry during non-rain periods and they become you know, raging torrents during wet periods. And so controlling volume or trying to promote groundwater recharge to maintain a base flow in the streams is really important goal. And, and so this volume control, if we can get more water into the ground, uh, more water into the plant life, certainly improves what people downstream of that development project experience. So volume control. Then water quality improvements. You know, when we build a, a shopping center and a parking lot, we build a road, all of those things that we were talking about as far as non-point sources of pollution, a lot of which are lawn fertilizers, road salts, trash and debris that wash into the water course, certainly degrade the quality of the water in the stream. And so it really impacts, you know, the invertebrate species that are trying to live in that water course. You know, the salamanders and you know, the crayfish and, and those things, indication of water quality, you know, die. And so, you know, fish can't be supported, excuse me, fish life can't be supported. And so the whole ecosystem kind of devolves. And so water quality is a big conversation. And one of the things that we are doing in Springfield as part of this partnership with the Wissahickon Creek communities is, and Brandon has been more involved with this and Mr. Wilson as well than, than any, is this partnership to deal with water quality improvements in the Wissahickon Creek. Do you want to talk a little bit of background there? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I will say that Commissioner Wilson has been uh, mm -hmm. more involved in the partnership or at least as longer than I have. Uh, but, you know, essentially what the, the Wissahickon Clean Water Partnership is, it's a voluntary association of the 13 municipalities in the Wissahickon watershed. Uh, 12 of uh, Montgomery County municipalities uh, representing over 98% of the watershed land area, uh, as well as the city of Philadelphia. So you have 12 Monco municipalities and the city of Philadelphia working together to address uh, water quality uh, throughout the Wissahickon uh, watershed. And you know, part of this is to address the, the clean water, uh, but another part of this is to uh, deal with uh, the, I'm gonna use a, a, a token term, uh, unfunded mandate uh, that uh, the federal and the state governments or agencies, DEP and the EPA have passed down 
uh, on each of the individual uh, municipalities uh, to uh, take more action, uh, which we all acknowledge is great needed, uh, but again, it comes at a cost. Uh, so what the partnership is, is seeks to do and has been quite successful in doing thus far, at least getting the, the ramping up stage of things going, is that instead of, uh, let's for example, Springfield, uh, paying out of pocket on its own to do these water quality improvements, uh, we would together join with the other municipalities in the partnership to do larger, more impactful projects throughout the watershed and kind of divvy out or spread out the, the work, the effort and the cost uh, of those projects. Uh, and you know, from my experience in obtaining or asking for money from other agencies, uh, other agencies do like when municipalities work together. Uh, and I can share that the, the wa watershed partnership uh, successfully secured $1.5 million from Montgomery County uh, to do water quality projects throughout the watershed. Now, the partnership is currently looking at all the different projects that it has listed with the, with the feedback from all the participating municipalities. Uh, and now we've had uh, the tough job of uh, selecting a few of them uh, to spend that $1.5 million on. Um, so, you know, again, it's a, it's a innovative collaboration that uh, is not only beneficial to each of the municipalities involved, uh, but we've overall had the support of DEP and the EPA who, you know, have told us that, you know, once we start getting projects done and we can have, you know, those uh, accomplishments checked off, it's a system or an effort that they would like to see replicated elsewhere. And I think I heard that Skip Act or the, the Perky Omen is looking at something very yeah, similar. Exactly. So, and, and maybe, you know, if we can get really deep into this, yeah. but, you know, so one of the things that happened is that, um, these environmental regulations are taking place and the EPA starts studying streams with a little more vigor. Um, many streams were identified as impaired. So the quality of the water in the stream has not been good. And so streams are classified as impaired and every stream that is in any kind of urban setting is an impaired stream these days. Certainly the Philadelphia area, certainly around Harrisburg, certainly around Pittsburgh, up by Scranton, most of those water courses have been, I've found to be impaired. And so what the regulations have said is that we gotta begin to help improve the quality of those streams and help them to become not so impaired. And <coughs> that obligation got placed on local government. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think uh, thus far, we've kind of given you a good basis, a preliminary foundation as to, you know, what stormwater is, you know, what we've done in the past and kind of taking you through a little bit of a, a, a journey through time uh, in terms of stormwater. And now we're at kind of at the present day uh, where, you know, we have these uh, water, you know, regulations coming pass on down. And I know, you know, we're going to take a little bit of break so everyone can kind of freshen up and grab some more uh, refreshments uh, and we'll be back, you know, we'll kind of carry on and kind of talk about, you know, what we're doing now and kind of the, some of the challenges uh, we're facing in terms of how we tackle stormwater management in the community. Uh, just before we break, just yeah. have one <coughs> comment. And I, I think we, we can't lose, uh, lose focus of, you know, why we're doing all this. And we're basically doing all this for the exact reason that, that, that Tim went over and got himself a, a, a drink of water, because we, we rely on this clean water for our drinking water. I mean, uh, Montgomery County is heavily reliant on, on, on wells, deep wells. The city of Philadelphia is, I think, 100% reliant on uh, pulling water from both the Delaware and the Schuylkill. Uh, the Wissahickon Creek, uh, uh, obviously flows right into the Schuylkill. So, uh, you know, one of the big reasons that the city of Philadelphia, the, uh, 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 the water department uh, has been a big uh, partner with us in this 
Creek uh, program, the cleanup, is that they want to try and ensure the quality of the water, uh, you know, continues. It, it doesn't deteriorate any further than where it is right now. Um, I'd also like to say that in Montgomery County and not too far from us here, we do have on un- we do have very high quality uh, water source uh, creeks that are contributing to the Wissahickon. So, so the whole object is to, is to try and uh, stop the uh, stop the creek from getting any worse and put put in place these programs to make it better for to allow us to you know use the resource that we all that we all need and and, and rely on you know uh, the, the fundamental resource of clean water so that's that's just one object we, we can't lose fact of, no, of, right. uh, that, of the of the goals Absolutely. yeah 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 yes. we mean <laughs> Maybe before we take a minute break, so we kind of got through all this kind of history of stormwater, kind of how we got to where we are today. Any questions or conversation? I don't know that we meant this to be a lecture. Yeah, sure. Hit it early on. Um, I think as we talk about uh, clean water for ourselves, and when you talk about riparian buffers, um, and uh, you, you talk about pollutants going to the fish and the uh, life in our streams, we come full tilt, you look at uh, new homes and what's the first thing people wanna do? Well, they'll put in trees and bushes and things, but now with species decline from climate change, I think what we all need to realize is that the riparian buffers actually, you can plant all the bushes you want, but if the water's not clean for actually the, right to the microbial level. And we're actually finding, I believe that uh, we can clean our water by going through and catching the sediment and actually having proper um, aquatic life and even biomes, I'm not sure. And it enhances our life, enhances is the word, all the way back up and through um, certainly clean water for us, but species improvements in our own backyards, birds, flowers that bring birds. So the things that I think we're gonna cover eventually, we can't just talk about clean water in its finite. It's not cyclical just to people, it's cyclical to the whole- The complete (laughs) environment, no, without a doubt. Absolutely, and that's that's a great point. And if, if I can go on a little bit of a tangent here, uh, the township actually just finished a project at Mermaid Park in Winmore, uh, thanks to the generous direction of the Board of Commissioners. Uh, over four hundred thousand dollars actually went into Mermaid Park, and that was that whole project started with a resident, uh, you know, coming up to then Commissioner Harbison saying, "Hey, I was at Mermaid Park, which is adjacent to the USDA facility on East Mermaid Lane. If any of you haven't gone there, it's one of my favorite parks. <laughs> Although I'll say that to every park." Uh, you know, he said the, the pond is covered in algae. It doesn't look good. It looks sick, you know, for as much as a pond can look sick, it looked sick. So after, you know, looking at it, studying it a little bit, uh, what we learned was to your point, uh, the habitat, the ecosystem had degraded to such a point that, you know, every, all the critters and all the life forms that lived in the pond that would have dealt with the algae were non-existent. So without something to control the algae growth, it just exploded. And you had the, these algae blooms that made the pond look sick. So what the township did was we identified that the issue with the pond and why it couldn't uh, sustain uh, that, you know, the anti-algae eating be- uh, life forms was that it was erosion. Uh, the creek leading into the pond was getting severely eroded and all that sediment that was coming off the creek was filling up the bottom of the pond, making it shallower. And when ponds get more shallow, it's easier to warm things up. And fish, eco life, they don't like shallow, warm ponds. They like, you know, like any of us yeah. in the summertime, they like deep, cold water, you know, to cool off and uh, stay cool. Uh, but plant life, algae specifically, loves warm, shallow water. So as all that sediment was filling up the pond and it was getting shallower and warmer, you had you know the species going down and the algae life going up. 
So what the, the township did with the support of the commissioners, uh, it, we stabilized that stream bank. You know, we fixed that stream bank so that there was no, ero there will be no erosion, uh, you know, moving forward uh, so that all that sediment wouldn't be going back into the pond. We also dredged the pond to make it deeper, right? So we fixed the creek, we dredged the pond, and we also added a little trail for the benefit of the, uh, of the residents. Uh, and then once we were done with the project, you know, after relocating the turtles and the life forms that were still in the pond, uh, you know, it looks night and day. You know, we have a couple pictures out on the project boards out there, you know, one from before the project, one from after the project. And, and to your point, ma'am, uh, you know, that's another reason why we're doing what we're doing with stormwater. So it's not just about clean water, but it's also about habitats and ecosystems and whatnot. Indeed. Thank you for bringing that up. And literally when the <clears throat> EPA looks at the health of a stream like the Wisp Dickens, they have what they call bug counts. Bug counts. And, and they go in, they send people in, and they turn over rocks, and they count how many bugs are there. Yeah, for, the more yeah. bugs, the better. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> in many parts of the Wisp Dickens, there are no bugs. So it's basically a dead stream, but. Indeed. Peter, I will say when I shared that with my kids, my three-year-old loved the idea of a bug count. No. <laughs> yeah, right. And I said, it, it's bugs. not as yeah. exciting yeah. as you think. <laughs> exactly. But uh, he, he loved the idea of a bug count. Uh, great. Yes. So you're talking about, um, do you have any monitoring programs in place? Does DEP have any monitoring programs in place for quality? So Integrity Avenue, you're basically looking at flow and volume, but top of the hill is what I haven't heard of in a long time is Tank Car Corporation of America and with the asbestos and all the other stuff that comes from the building after it's knocked down, if it ever it is. And I really think that um, I'm just curious that if you're looking downstream in Integrity Avenue, are you going to be monitoring what comes off of Tank Car Corporation or other non-point sources of pollution? Thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, I as the project manager for Tank Car, because Tank Car is a township-owned property. The township acquired that back in what 15, 2015. Uh, and we've been slowly working with uh, DEP to kind of ensure that when we're ready to turn tank car into a public park, which is what it will be, uh, you know, my word on it, the township's word on it, it will be a public park. Uh, you know, we actually just finished up 18 months uh, of, we worked with an environmental engineer uh, to put in deep water mo monitoring wells. So there are wells in there that are sampling uh, the water, you know, because for those who don't know, Tank Car Corporation, it was an industrial use. It's, you know, a brownfield, which we can spend all day on brownfields. Maybe that's the next topic for the next public workshop. Uh, but, you know, we have been monitoring the water. You know, we've been reporting that to the EPA because the township is taking it through the, stat, uh, the state uh, act two, which is the voluntary cleanup program, uh, which is, again, voluntary. We don't need to do it, but the township wants to uh, have that uh, comfort saying, hey, we took this through, we've worked with DEP to ensure that, you know, this site is clean and this site can be turned into a safe, you know, environmentally friendly public park. And again, what that park looks like will be another topic for down the line, which will be subject to public meetings and public input. And I'm sure there's going to be, you know, a basin or two in there yeah. that will kind of, to your point, help capture and clean that runoff before it even gets offsite. But, but Paul, I, re I, I remember can, that yeah. question uh, because that is a very good topic that we'll be hitting kind of phase two of this conversation about some of the improvements that we have in mind within our township and within our watersheds. And so that Integrity Avenue, remember that question. We'll, we'll come back to that one as, as we well, get through. You're, here. On, yes. you're on the top of our mind. Don't worry yes. about that. All right. But great question, great question. Anyone else? Susan. I've had the benefit of getting a preview of this presentation. So before this break, might I suggest, uh, so that while people are on the break, we can think about it. 
the that to go through that next slide, uh, uh, just a brief overview um, for us to think about uh, so that when we return, you can elaborate on, on some of this. I think these are some of the pieces parts uh, that really highlight um, why our dollars are going where they go. Yes. Uh, and also, before you even launch into this, I wanted to add for Brandon's sake, you know, you mentioned that $400,000 investment into Mermaid, but I found, uh, I just wanted to highlight your grant work and, and also that there does require a lot of grant work in this space. Uh, if you could res um, cl clarify how much actual tax dollar went in and how much was grant funded so that we can understand for even projects like that, where we oh, feel sure. like it may be necessary, uh, the allocation is is, yeah. is great. Uh, so from a budgetary standpoint, uh, nothing for, from the budget. Uh, we were successful in securing uh, over, you know, almost quarter of a million dollars. So about $250,000 from uh, the county and other, you know, grant work. So that's money that they gave us to do this project. Uh, and the, the difference, that delta, uh, was actually funded through the American Rescue Act. Uh, so as many of you might or might not be aware of, uh, the American Rescue Act, or ARPA as its uh, shorthand, uh, was you know, essentially money that was passed down to kind of respond to the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and I could talk to you during the break, during the whole thing, because it, it, another topic I could spend all day on. Uh, but you know, the delta there was spent uh, you know, funded uh, through that American Rescue Act. So short answer is nothing from the budget, nothing from our capital fund. You know, this was basically fully funded through grant work and through that American Rescue Act that was funds given to us by the federal government. Thank you, Susie. Absolutely. And as, as Susie points out, this might be a good slide to kind of pause with or after you know, as we look at trying to solve all of these problems, all these sins of the past moving forward, the one common theme to solution is, is money. You know, we, we're going to have to spend money to solve these problems. And next couple of slides, we'll talk more about these things. But we talked a bit about these obligations that the township has under our Wissahickon Creek watershed obligation to improve water quality. And some of this money coming from grants, obviously, but a, a larger component of that conversation is that the community has now an obligation to maintain our storm sewer systems. So we got the pipes in the street, we've got to make sure that they are clean and operational. And, and so there's a lot of money being spent on our obligation to maintain existing infrastructure for water quality improvements. So that's one component of the things that we need to think about in Springfield uh, as we look to solve some of these problems. The next thing, or another thing, is just the complete absence of storm sore infrastructure. You know, there's so many places in town where we don't have the ability to capture and then treat. So as we look at helping to improve things around town, absence of infrastructure is a big one. Another place we have to spend money, again, out of the budget, is aging infrastructure, where you know the pipes and systems that were in place in the 1950s um, no longer are structurally sound or completely clogged or- Or they don't cut you know, the increased flow. Exactly. They don't, they don't cut it anymore. <laughs> so this aging infrastructure is, is a big issue for us. And then you know, what do we do with flooding? You know, can we make improvements to the flooding again, are going to be expensive. And so we look at these buckets of money that are needed to solve the problem. And how do you distribute that money to each of these four components is a very difficult question to answer. Sometimes it seems you need the wisdom of Solomon to figure out where this money goes and how to spend it effectively and where to spend it effectively. And so all four components are very important to the total solution. And uh, we'll talk more about them in a minute or two. But uh, it's a, an issue that the commissioners face is, you know, this budget and, and where to allocate funds. And Brandon's got to find grant money to deal with all this stuff. So that's, uh, again, in a consideration as we think about solutions moving forward. And so with that, uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll come back, you know, help yourself to some refreshments. Uh, and I do welcome you to go take a look at the project boards that are out there, uh, because we do have some 
uh, stormwater projects in the pipe or recently completed uh, that we're more than happy to answer any of your questions about. Uh-oh, very official again, great. Well, thanks. So we kind of gotten through kind of a lot of the history of, of where we've been in the past and how we've gotten to today. And as the last slide that we put up was kind of all these costs. And so one of the things that comes next is a question that I had, what do Tiger Woods and Springfield have in common? Jim, just before yes. we go there, could you just go back to that one oh, slide? I and could you explain to the audience what an MS4 is? Ah, uh, shoot, yeah, again, some more. Some more of those acronyms. So as part of this program that the EPA put in place to deal with non-point sources of pollution, the EPA uh, through the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection started a, a permitting program. And so every township, Springfield, um, has a permit to operate a municipally separate storm sewer system, MS4. And it talks about a lot of things, um, many of which are tied to things like the water quality in the Wissahickon Creek, but certainly to um, make sh making sure that as we operate this system, we are doing things to uh, meet some minimum protocols, things like good housekeeping at our public works facilities, you know, what are we doing with our salt storage? What are we doing with the operations and maintenance of our fleet? What are we doing, you know, so we can protect um, our, our storm sores from, from clogging and, you know, digging debris and trash operationally. Um, an obligation for public outreach, you know, informational meetings like we're having today. Uh, what can we do to make sure that the public is aware of things that they are doing that could potentially adversely impact water quality. And so these minimum protocols are all part of this MS4 program that allows us to maintain a permit to operate our systems. And so MS4, it, it, it's been thrown around a lot and, and certainly it is the permit that um, allows us to uh, qualify for grant funding and uh, we have to be kind of in good standing, to, you know, be a candidate for grant funding. And we file a report every year that talks about the things that we are doing and uh, making sure that we are indeed in good standing. It's about this thick, right? It's thick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if we didn't, if we didn't comply, if we didn't have an MS4, what would happen to the town? Yeah, they're, they're, you know, interesting bad. bad things. Well, there's certainly fines that are, you know, accessible. Um, a lot of this focus in the past, when it first came out, 2004, 2005, DEP thought they needed to carry a very big stick. And they focused a lot on Lancaster County farms and municipalities that discharged directly into the Chesapeake Bay. This is a Chesapeake Bay conversation. And so there were a couple of communities who were you know, like complacent um, around Harrisburg who got some fines for not you know, participating effectively in the program. The program is difficult, it's large. There are not enough people in the Department of Environmental Protection that are monitoring. So it has kind of been a, an evolving process of you know, what is the obligation? What isn't the obligation? And so that MS4 component of our cost obligations is, is a large one for sure. So Tiger. Um, we have a lot in common with Tiger. We've got a lot of aging infrastructure. <laughs> so, you know, we look at a pipe like this. This is a corrugated metal pipe. This corrugated metal pipe material was very popular 50 years ago. Uh, a problem with corrugated metal pipe is that, you know, especially the bottom kind of erodes, you know, rots away. And so, you know, water goes all over the place. You know, there's erosion, there's sinkholes, there's issues. A lot of aging infrastructure like this that we got to repair and replace. Um, there is this past couple of weeks, our public works department looking at storm sore piping over on Pleasant Avenue found a pipe that was completely blocked with debris, just, you know, silt and sediment. And there were pieces of carpet they pulled out of there. 
Uh, but it took them almost two weeks to get that storm pipe clean. And so we've got this kind of infrastructure obligation to, to maintain what we have, to replace and repair what we have. It's again, a large component of costs that come out of township budget every year. Another big thing that we deal with is this kind of app infrastructure. You know, Brandon and Ian Hammer, the public works director and I are out around town on a pretty regular basis. And this is just a Halls Lane, just a picture of Halls Lane. And one of the things that you notice if you drive down Halls Lane is that there are no storm sore inlets anywhere to be found. And right after Hurricane Ida, we were kind of doing a damage assessment and we visited with a number of people on Halls Lane and they just said, water is running everywhere, there's water everywhere, what are we gonna do? And as you look around like, yeah, it was running everywhere because there was no place to pick it up or take. So there are a lot of areas in our community where we really need storm sore infrastructure. We need to put in pipes and inlets to gather and capture and then manage that runoff. So again, another cost component that we face that we need to deal with is kind of this absence of storm sore infrastructure. One of the areas that we have been dealing with and Brandon got some grant funding for <laughs> after much you, and this is just one example that is very present in our minds of, of some of the issues that we at Springfield face. And it's a little case study over Carlisle Road of what happened some number of years ago. And the slide is a little bit difficult to see perhaps, but this is the paper mill run stream. This comes down and runs through and comes through Cisco Park. Um, and it is up in Winmore by some of those very large homes that are up on Montgomery Avenue, a very natural water course. It drains right down to Carlisle Road. And when Car Carlisle Road was built, 70s vintage kind of stuff, again, no regulations in place. Uh, the developer thought it'd be a great idea to get a couple more lots in on Carlisle. And he took that very natural water course and put it in a pipe right adjacent to an, one of the homes he built. That pipe wasn't large enough to handle the flows that we face today. It went out into the street, took a left, took a right, and discharges out back into the stream. But that whole enclosure of what was a natural water course really leaves us with a lot of problems today, along with the kind of unregulated development up in Winmore. And we can talk maybe at the next break. Uh, on this board is a map of the watershed. You know, if it rains left of the line, not a problem. If it rains right of the line, all that water drains down this channel and out to Carlisle. And you can pretty clearly see the amount of unmanaged development that occurred in that watershed over the time and years since the 50s, um, contributing to problems that we are facing today. And Tim, um, just to kind of emphasize for the, those watching and those in the audience, uh, you know, this is a prime example of how uh, the township has been dealing with stormwater holistically. Um, you know, even though we might not be currently thinking of or actively doing something in your immediate neighborhood, uh, we know where it floods, you know, we're all well aware of it. Um, it's our hope to kind of tackle it in other areas to kind of lessen uh, the impact, you know, downstream. So for example, this Carlisle uh, ex example, uh, what we did when, you know, Tim, myself and uh, Ian Hammer, our public works director, uh, were out and about town, kind of really kind of wrapping our heads about, you know, holistically where, what's contributing to the flooding, for example, on Brookside Avenue, you know, Brookside and the, those homes, along with a few others, uh, in other areas of the townships, they get really heavily hit by flooding. Uh, so we kind of tracked up the, the creek and we kind of followed it uh, to one of its sources. And for Carlisle, as you can kind of see on the screen there, uh, that's the stream bank, or what I should say is left of the stream bank, right? Uh, heavily eroded. Uh, all that sediment's got to go somewhere. Uh, and Tim will kind of tell you about, you know, 
immediate impacts in that neighborhood. Uh, but we can tell you that from, you know, what we've kind of learned is that all that sediment at, at, at some point ends up in Paper Mill Run at Cisco Park. You know, so all the water that comes through this creek ends up at Cisco Park. And the more that comes down this creek and the more sediment that carries with it, that increases the volume. So, you know, it's not the only contributor to a lot of the flooding that happens at Montgomery, Bethlehem Pike, Brookside area, uh, but it's one of them. It doesn't make the situation better. And we just use this as an example. Again, this condition occurs throughout Montgomery County. There are many places sort of similar to this in Springfield Township, but it is certainly a good illustration of what happens with unmanaged runoff. And so this vertical stream bank, all of this highly erodible, you know, condition, if you compare that to one of the first slides that I showed about, you know, the idealistic stream bank that is kind of level and vegetated and buffered, what happens when you get these flash flooding conditions because of a heavy downpour where everything is just directed right to the stream, the water is rushing without any kind of impediment and it it turns a bank, it does this kind of damage. And, and that damage then impacts properties downstream for sure, as Brandon explained. And again, this is just one place where there has been a lot of downstream issues. Um, the picture on the right is what this channel looks like up in the woods before you get down to Carlisle. That looks pretty good. You know, there's a lot of, you know, vegetation. There's a lot of rock channel. It doesn't look horrible makes its way downstream. It comes past that area that is highly eroded and it ends up in this small head wall. All of the water from this very large watershed from this very natural channel is put in a pipe there. It goes through some inlets, actually comes out to Carlisle Road up at closer to the top of the hill. It runs down Carlisle, it comes across Carlisle, it makes a bend captured in some storm sewer inlets that adds to the water that happens a hole in this kind of general vicinity. And then it, the amount of water that comes down the street can't be handled by that storm sewer system. So it floods, it kind of tops this curb and it comes right down this driveway, right past Amelia's house. Mm -hmm. And there are probably eight different properties kind of in this general vicinity that are really adversely impacted by this runoff and Amelia being the lowest property on Carlisle. You know, that water during Ida especially was kind of running into her garage and almost taking the cars in her driveway and carrying them away. And so certainly the impacts of, again, some sins of the past. We took that very natural water course, put it in a pipe, made it do some odd things. And the result that we're facing today is boy, there are properties that are now in danger, you know, hazard properties that we would like to try and fix. And, and to be uh, the golden lining of, of all this is that uh, the township secured uh, federal emergency management funding uh, to fix that stream bank. Uh, so that stream bank will be stabilized, hopefully starting, the project should start in like two weeks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's one example of things actually getting done. You know, I, I'm of the person, talk is nice, but actions speak louder than words. Better. So, and, and a very complicated process, you know, dealing with a number of homeowners and easements and rights of access and improvements. And Brandon was very key in getting all of that done. But, uh, you know, people, when you come to them with this legal document that they need to sign, people are certainly hesitant yeah. and people's schedules conflict. And it's just, it's a very tedious process to get to the end of the day where we can actually start construction. So. FEMA is not easy to deal with either. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, the, it, it is a project that will be starting soon. So beautiful. So we talked for a while about kind of the left branch of, of that stormwater issue and the environmental issues, some of the impacts on the streams and waterways, but certainly, you know, maybe a more concerning issue for property owners is, you know, risk to life and the property, some of these flooding issues that we're facing. 
And so we can talk again about some of these floodplain issues. And I guess maybe one of the benefits of being located near this floodplain is that you are, uh, you know, floodplain insurance from the federal government is available to you. We talked a bit with, where's Mayor? Um, we talked about flooding issues and high water people having water in their homes and there's no flood insurance for that. And I guess it's true that if you don't live adjacent to what is a regulated floodplain, um, you know, the FEMA flood insurance isn't so much available to you, but if you are adjacent, you know, sort of the federal flood insurance program is, is, is available. But one of the things that I look at when I see this map is how many homes and how many businesses are impacted by what is a regulated floodplain. You look, oh, you know, this is hot hole in neighborhood kind of adjacent to 309 and, and how many homes really, if today's sensibilities were applied, would never have been built. You know, there are requirements that would protect that floodplain from development. But again, sins of the past, we have so much that was built in and around what is known to be a high water risk area. And, you know, certainly <laughs> one of the classic examples is Upper Dublin Township, you know, Virginia Drive and Pennsylvania Avenue. How, how many businesses have been certainly flooded out and impacted by development that occurred before, you know, meaningful floodplain regulations were in place. And so when we are dealing with flood risk and flood hazard, you know, the, the the solutions are kind of overwhelming as the extent of the problem is kind of over. Again, if we were trying to do these kind of neighborhoods today or develop these subdivisions, none of those homes would have been built. Uh, but the fact that they were doesn't excuse us from trying to find solutions uh, to put those people in a better position than they would otherwise be. And, Peter. And, and Tim, all, over the course of the history uh, uh, or the recent history of Springfield Township. I mean, we we have recognized uh, that problem and we have tried to address it when when we can. I mean, the biggest the biggest example of you know somebody building houses where they shouldn't have built houses is down on Hemlock Road, where the township about ten years ago secured grants to buy those buy all those buy buy I think it was eight or. A 12, but that we, we, we talk on that, Peter. Yeah, there's a slide on that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. Commissioner Wilson know. makes an excellent point. Oh, yeah. well, absolutely. So we flood, flood plains. Um, and again, let's talk about what is flooding. This is a, a, a kind of a favorite slide. This is actually during Ida. This is over in Collegeville. Kaiser Miller Ford is just a classic example of a car dealership built next to the Perkyoman Creek. And, you know, on, on many storms, completely goes underwater. You know, that's certainly a flood issue. And that's certainly a flood that impacts life and property for sure. One of the things that we deal with regularly is a slide on the left where there is water running through somebody's backyard. And yes, it's disconcerting. There is water running in my backyard. It's discolored, but it's not in the home. It's not threatening the home. It's really um, a stormwater conveyance through a designed swale. And so some of that educational process is that, okay, if that's water running through your backyard and it's not to your basement or it's not into your garage and it's making its way around the structure and into the street, while disheartening, it's not an issue that, that maybe rises to the level of, of what we face with Amelia's home over on Carlisle. Again, disheartening, there's a lot of water running in my backyard. And I get a lot of phone calls from all over the county. Tim, it's raining, my backyard is wet. And I'm like, mm, yeah, okay, it's, it's gonna be wet. And so managing this kind of issue um, where it is not impacting the structure, maybe is a little lower on the priority list versus people who are dealing with the water in their homes. Um, and so again, just kind of keeping a perspective on, on what is flooding and what kind of is, is not, is important to remember. Certainly during Ida, we had our fair share of high water events. Oh, sorry, Susan. That left side was the 
would you call that flooding or not flooding when you show that picture? Yeah, I wouldn't, the left side picture, Suze, mm -hmm. I would not call that flooding. Because no. I think I think many of us uh, colloquially would just see that and say, oh, it's yeah. flooding in my backyard. I've been there myself. Yes. Um, so that's important, for, I think, for residents to understand. No, absolutely. Thank you for emphasizing that point. So certainly when we're designing or reviewing the design of subdivisions, there are swales that are incorporated into a, any site design. And they're meant to convey stormwater you know, around properties, around structures to a stormwater management system. And so water flowing in a swale is, is a conveyance as opposed to a flood hazard or flood risk. So good point to clarify. So we don't have to go back to this later, but perhaps you will cover this. This happens in my backyard. And I actually would eventually like at some point, I will invest because of what uh, permaculture is what people talk about it. You, you actually embrace collecting as much water as you can so that um, it's yours and yeah. it will uh, enrich your property. This was built to let the water to flow, correct? Correct. But I could potentially in, um, I guess, maybe, I, I don't know how wide my backyard is. I could catch portions of it, but then still pass it along. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. And, and I guess if we would talk about maybe to your to point, there are things we can do to improve the community dealing with water like this for sure. But in the past, one of the sins of the past, instead of letting this water naturally run over land, somebody would build a big pipe, put it in a pipe and just shoot this water downstream and then Hey, it's off my property. I'm happy, but the people downstream from me are now twice as impacted by that flow because the pipe was much more efficient at conveying that water downstream. And so each of us, when dealing with things like the picture on the left, I think we need to be cognizant of what's happening adjacent and downstream and all of those things for sure. So again, um, we had our share of issues during Ida. This is down at Montgomery and Bethel and Pike, outside of Brookside here. I think this is over off of Integrity, certainly paper mill. Uh, this is certainly Integrity here, Paul. That was one of your favorite pictures. Like, and again, all of this water really appears because of those sins of the past. You know, if we hadn't piped streams, if we had tamed riparian corridor, if we had done you know, maybe we wouldn't experience this type of flooding that we're dealing with today. But at the same time, you know, the economic development of our community, you know, the, the important retail properties along Bethel and Pike, you know, homes where people can live, certainly all of component in the conversation, but things that we're dealing with like Bethel and Pike, Montgomery and Brookside, um, you know, how do we fix those? And so there are things that we are trying to do, and Brendan may have mentioned it earlier, but over at Sandy Run Country Club along Burton, um, the, the folks on Burton really saw the impacts during Ida. And we were able to identify an area on the golf course that we could expand an existing kind of low area and create a detention basin with some water quality improvement components helping to direct runoff from the course to a place that is less impactful. Again, getting water out of people's basements and garages to a point where it can be conveyed um, with less damage and impact. We were talking about over at Integrity and improving an, a low-lying area there, Paul, where um, we could capture, manage, and again, not solve problems, but help chip away at problems is kind of the goal. And that project on Burton starts Monday. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, yeah, I live in Burton right there. So you guys, can you just go over that again real quick in terms of everything? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So uh, it, we can spend a little more time on anything that we need to talk about, but certainly that area uh, within that Burton Road watershed. Um, do we have any pictures there, B? I'm not sure we do. Yeah. 
there's a, a fairly large watershed that comes off the golf course property. You know, the golf course was built in, I don't know, 1930 or whatever that was. Um, and so the Burton Road properties were built probably in the 50s, 60s. And all that runoff from the golf course was never really anticipated in the design of the Burton Road homes. And so water comes off that course, it enters Burton, you know, that whole area is pretty flat. And by the time that water gets to 309, so the whole water system in that Burton Road neighborhood is, is surcharged. And there is a lot of flooding that occurs. And, and so by taking uh, an area of the golf course and creating a much larger volume for a stormwater basin, um, the amount of water that needs to be handled by the Burton Road storm source finished and yeah, so essentially we would be creating a basin to capture the stormwater running off the country club off the sandy run country club and then controlling the rate of flow controlling the rate controlling the volume uh as to you know how fast and how much is hitting that stormwater system you know kind of yeah. easing off the you know the spigot a little bit rather than just letting it flow uncontrollably i'm aware yeah. of that yeah we we can talk to you. We have all those specifics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Get, uh, a little bit of. So happy know, to chat. Yeah, and, and we are building the basin as large as we possibly can without adversely impacting. Right. I know we have to also. Yeah. The yeah. Exactly. And they have been very cooperative. We came to them kind of had. Guys, they were very cooperative with us. Yeah. 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 But happy to answer any of the questions you have. Um, one of the things that, that look at, again, this is during, I think, Ida and some of the heavy storms. Uh, this is same, yeah, two pictures of the kind of same area along Claire. There is a little piece of storm pipe that runs behind the shed. I think it's you know a 12 inch pipe or something. And, and certainly um, was never designed to handle the amount of rain and runoff that creates, you know, kind of a drainage path behind these homes and these yards. And so certainly you take a look out your back window and you see this kind of condition, again, pretty disheartening. Thankfully, the homes on St. Clair are high. Uh, and so there was really no you know, structural issues with regard to the home itself, but a lot of rear yard damage. There were fences that were moved, there were sheds that were pushed, uh, and trying to deal with these kind of high water events. This is not a mapped floodplain that FEMA would identify. Um, it's just a poorly drained area that, you know, again, as we look at improvement, be cognizant of perhaps a, an enlarged storm sore system in the backyard or in the beds of the adjacent roads would, would be helpful. Uh, but again, as you improve capture and conveyance, just moving all this water that's kind of in a detention basin today, moving that downstream and further adversely impacting properties uh, as you go further down the watershed. So again, we see this as a problem, but we wanna be careful not to transfer this problem to homes that don't have problems today. So it's again, it's a delicate kind of balancing act. Um, some of the damage. So this is Cisco Park. Um, certainly there is our, our little pedestrian bridge during Ida was completely undermined. Uh, Gabion baskets were destroyed and knocked into the stream. So, so again, an example of kind of the property damage that occurs from these high water events and things that, you know, as Yep, spend some money, although some of the grant funded. Uh, we got that all fixed for free. All fixed, so we got this all fixed for free, thanks to Brandon. But if you go down to Cisco Park today, you can see that these gates are placed, stream was cleaned up. But it's not difficult to imagine that during that storm, much of the debris that washed off these embankments, that certainly washed off the Carlisle Road um, stream bank that we were just looking at earlier, all ended up in the pond at Cisco, you know? So 
Cisco's pond is now the repository of a lot of this debris and silt. And at some point, we're going to have to go in and, and dredge the Cisco pond again. Um, but certainly as the as that pond fills up with sediment, it then spills over and discharges through the school bus depot, discharges down to Bethlehem Pike, discharges down Brookside. And so a lot of the issues downstream all come from what is a pretty large watershed that drains down to those areas and again causes, causes issue. So one of the things that I wanted to describe is that it's not all bad news. You know, as, a community, as regulators, as designers, we really have evolved over the years. And so all of those EPA and Chesapeake Bay Foundation actions have resulted in um, a, a much better handling of an acknowledgement of stormwater runoff. So again, we had this basin, this is my favorite basin from Upper Dublin, and we look at what happens in a rainstorm today. Water rushes off of the adjacent roadways, the adjacent subdivision, run into this detention basin and is carried by this low flow channel. So any road salts, you know, fertilizers from maintaining this beautiful turf lawn in this detention basin, um, anything that would otherwise be a pollutant, antifreeze, you know, asbestos off the brake shoes, um, you know, uh, oil drippings off cars, all of that stuff is ran through this basin, through this concrete low flow channel and hits this kind of outlet structure. And again, this, this was a, a 1990s vintage outlet structure. It does very little to hold back other than the most severe storm event. So any pollutant that enters this basin is discharged right stream, right into the creek and enters the Withdicken Creek watershed. And so it's a basin like this that was, hey, it was a good first attempt, but as our knowledge evolves and as our industry evolves, this is a bad thing for the environment, not doing much to deal with what we've got today. So moving forward, what we're doing with warm water is trying to um, understand that we need to clean the water. And we do a lot of that through vegetation. So all the nutrients that are coming off the roads and lawns, we're filtering through dense vegetation. And those plant, that plant material would then uptake those nutrients and, and help clean the water. Certainly dense vegetation is gonna filter out the road cinders and the salts and, and the otherwise debris that is carried by the runoff. So these more naturalized basins um, are really where we are heading and what we are trying to do in, in most instances. And we talked about swales, you know, so swales that can convey water in, in the past have been maintained lawns. Again, same issue where this water just kind of rips through these swales and along with it carries all those pollutants. What we're trying to do today is do some more dense vegetation in our naturalized and vegetated swales where we're letting grasses and plant material that thrives with kind of wet feet help to provide that filtering, help to provide some velocity reduction, you know, trying to make improvements to this runoff through how we deal with a swale. One of the things we really have been doing a lot of are our rain garden designs. Um, people have to get the idea that we've got to do something better with our homes. And so these rain gardens, you know, are a great idea to let that water from your property drain to a depressed area where it's planted with you know, material that likes wet feet that can be attractive uh, and, and certainly a technique that, that we've been using as, as an industry for sure. And, and Tim, you know, the, between the swales and the rain gardens, you know, that's something that private property owners can do on their own. Yes, sir. You know, that's a, the, a surefire way. I was talking to someone in the audience about you know how they install the rain garden, you know to capture storm water and you know does it solve the issue? No, but it helps, right? Indeed. And that's something that private property owners can do uh, on their own. 
Absolutely. Um, I, again, one of the things that is different today than what was present yesterday is how we review new development applications. And I've got two examples here. This is uh, Squires Ridge out off of uh, Bridge Avenue. And comparing the development that had occurred in the 1970s and 80s where there was no stormwater management measures that were implied. At Squires Ridge, every one of these blue dots is some kind of stormwater management feature. Whether it's a vegetated swale, whether it's a rain garden, a larger detention basin, all of that is part of their stormwater management system. Um, this is over at Lavrock. Uh, very similar. There are underground detention basins. There are above ground basins. Um, there are a great number of street inlets that collect more efficiently, gather and convey that runoff to a treatment facility. And so a lot of the impact of, of those earlier regulations that came out of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation issues um, now are reflected in a much different way to design and account for runoff. And Township has ordinances that impact this, that require developers and any homeowner actually, as they're increasing the amount of impervious cover on their lot to deal with the adverse impacts of, of runoff. Um, these plans are not only reviewed by the township, my office and township staff, but also they go through um, the DEP and in Montgomery County, they go via the Montgomery County Soil Conservation District. So. Uh, the conservation district acts as an agent for DEP to review all of these stormwater plans. And, um, and there's a permit issued that says, yes, you have met your obligation for water quality improvement, rate reduction, and volume reductions. So there was some conversation we're having about what happens if Harston Woods develops, what's it gonna happen? Well, if anything that develops is going to have to be much more aware and cognizant and permits issued that deal with stormwater runoff in a much more effective way than ever was prep. And so, you know, the news is not all bad, but. Quick disclaimer for anyone who might or might not be watching that rate, there is no land development plan for Harston Woods. Yeah, that was a question that <laughs> the, we got the, from the back the, of the room. Yeah. The, the signal flares were like yeah. going off in my head. Uh, there, There is no plan for that property at this point, as you might or might not be aware. Uh, the Board of Commissioners did issue a partial condemnation for that property to save the woodlands and, and whatnot. So, uh, and part of their argument, uh, one of the reasonings for the commissioners, and I don't want to speak for any of the three commissioners in the room, was, you know, to preserve those woodlands and to preserve the natural habitats of that area. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, kind of just to quickly summarize, you know, what you kind of just explained very, very thoroughly. Um, so like when there is a new land development plan, they can't make stormwater worse. That's rule number one, can't make it worse, you know? And, and, and maybe to that point, B, and, and Commissioner Wilson was kind of instrumental. Uh, we've got a new application for the Skin Soft building on Willow Grove Avenue. And their application came in and, and they met obligations under our ordinance. They're actually reducing the amount of impervious cover on that property, therefore having incremental improvement effect on runoff. Um, we asked from, we said, this is a critical watershed in our community. I'd like you guys a little bit more than, than the bare minimum. And they were hesitant, like, wait a minute, it's gonna cost more money for us to do more improvements. You know, we, we, our budgets are tight as they are. You know, we really can't, uh, but Commissioner Wilson at the public meeting challenged the developer. And uh, he did respond. He got back to us this week and said, okay, okay, you win. Um, I'm going to do more than minimum obligation to help improve the watershed that is downstream of that new property. And so I think it is a continued effort as we see new development and, and improve what otherwise is there. And I think um, before I hand off, and I don't mean to jump in real quick, uh, I think you hit on an important distinction about how government plays well with each other. Uh, you know, there's township laws, there's state laws, there's federal laws, we all know, right? The township can only 
go up to the state law. We can go only go up to it. We can always do less. We don't, uh, but we can't do more. So the state and the feds really set that bar. You know, we can't go past that bar. We can certainly go under it, which again, we don't do, uh, but we can take it right up to that bar. And then again, we do ask that, you know, anything above that bar is more of a request. No problem. I just want to make a point that um, in the process of building, however, some of those mitigations that you put in place are not functioning until after the neighborhood is completely constructed, which is why we had so much of a problem from this development. So hopefully now that it's finished, maybe these things will work, but all those storm drains were blocked during construction. There wasn't grass on the lawns during construction. And you know, unfortunately, Ida happened right in the middle of that. Indeed. Yeah, to your point, there's obviously that critical stage, you know, when the earth is disturbed and the infrastructure is not functioning, that becomes, uh, becomes critical. And so when Ida hits, it kind of all bets are off. But yes. And, and if, there's an, is, if there is a stormwater, you know, management that's not working on a private development or whatnot, just give us a call. We're, we're more than happy to go and make sure that it's functioning. You know, there are some people that enjoy like saying, hey, is this working? If not, you got to fix it. And this is what you need to do to fix it. I have a question about long term. So you, you put a retention basin in underground. Um, I've seen some of them go in. They're pretty phenomenal. But they do have a lifespan. And if especially well, residential or commercial, I believe I don't know what the regulations are, but the money should be there when those items, those catchments become invalid and need to be reviewed and accessed. In the same way the township has the expense to uh, review, you know, we can do tax dollars and things, but if you have uh, a huge development goes in, developer takes their money, is it in a maintenance plan? Very good question. The answer is yes. And, and again, um, prior to kind of the 2005 vintage, there was nothing in place. But today, a um, couple things happen. So a plan like this is supported by a document. It's the post-construction stormwater management plan. Get courted along with a stormwater operations and maintenance agreement gets recorded against the property in Montgomery County Recorder's office. And it basically says that you're operating this infrastructure. And in this instance, there's a homeowners association who has this obligation to maintain. You need to maintain this in perpetuity. And if there is a problem and you know the township or DEP can notify you that you must repair, if you don't repair, the township has the right, not necessarily the obligation, but the right to go in and effect the repair and then lien the property. So yeah, that's one of the things that really has rolled out of that process is to make sure the long-term issues are, uh, are put in place so that they can be maintained again for the long-term. Um, uh, these are some kind of pictures we took the other day uh, uh, of out at Leverock, but you know, just the size and dimensions of, of the stormwater basins that were built. Um, again, they're kind of devoid of turf, but hopefully by the spring, we're gonna get a lot more vegetation in these things uh, and they're gonna function much more effectively over the long term. Um, there is a process that a developer needs to go through called the notice of termination. And at some point this developer is gonna say, okay, we've done everything that we were obligated to do. Uh, come sign off on my permit. And that goes to the DEP, it comes to the township. And before that permit is signed off, that everything is in place, all this vegetation, you know, all the plant material, all the function of this basin has to be operational. Uh, and so there is follow-up after construction where that takes place. And again, 15, 20 years ago, none of that would, would have occurred. So again, we're, as an industry and as local government, we are really trying to make improvements. That was a very gratuitous question that you asked. <laughs> because we, we certainly can't leave today's conversation without the elephant in the room. And that is certainly the amount of 
very intense, very localized storms that we have been receiving. And, you know, uh, so this 1% storm, the one that all the maps are based off of, all our designs are based off of, is an assumption. And this comes from uh, you know, the Oceanographic Administration uh, data, is that a big storm, this 1% storm, the 100-year storm, our area would receive about 8.4 inches of rain over a 24 hour period. And that would be distributed kind of in a bell curve. There's gonna be a little bit of rain that starts, the intensity of the storm hits us, there's a lot of water and then it kind of fades away. The storms that we have been experiencing make that a difficult design to follow. Ida, you know, locally we had, you know, seven to 10 inches of rain in a very brief period of time. When you get that much water, that concentrated in a very developed and congested area, we're going to see the flooding that we saw. And, and so the difficulty in dealing with what climate change is forcing us to deal with is a question that I don't know that any of us can really answer, other than to be aware. Uh, a lot in the industry about resilient infrastructure, you know, if you get one of these cloudbursts and this rain is on us you know what can we do maybe it's sandbagging our floors. maybe it is making sure that public works goes out and cleans inlets before these storm events hit which they do which they do yeah uh, but certainly being aware that even with the latest information and the latest design standards if we are hit by a storm like ida um really there's not a lot that we can do other than, you know, hold on and do everything we can to keep our properties and our families safe. And so just, we can't leave today without having that kind of conversation. It's something that as an industry, as design engineers, as local government, you know, we were trying to find answers, but the sins of the past, our inner ring suburbs that were developed in the fifties and the sixties makes this issue much worse than areas somewhere in the north area of Montgomery County where there's a lot of open ground where stormwater has a chance to dissipate and move, but it, it's certainly an issue that we can't avoid. Okay, so there's things we can do. Uh, you know, it's not all a bleak picture. You know, working together, working with grant funding, working with individuals and communities, there are things that we can do to help. You know, we talk about local homeowners' ability to impact change. And collecting stormwater and reusing it on your property is a, a great start. We talk about rain barrels as, you know, just something we can do. So your downspouts run into, you know, 55 gallon drums, what have you, we can use that water to irrigate your lawns or your gardens, um, or just let that water slowly release in the days after a storm taking that amount of water out of the watershed as an individual probably doesn't have much impact, but as a community, it probably could. So rain barrels are something that we, we talk about. One of the things that has become more and more popular is trying to find areas that are developed with turf grass that are not really utilized and converting them to, to a meadow, you know, allowing what has been a maintained, fertilized area and letting it go more natural. Creates habitat for birds and you know, insect species, creates an opportunity for stormwater absorption and to reduce the rate of runoff. A lot of golf courses are, are using these kind of technologies in areas that don't affect their golf course play, but a meadow turned you know, uh, from lawn to meadow is a good way to help mitigate some of that runoff. Yes, sir. I've heard a lot about that lately, but what is the real impact of one of those kind of gardens? Does it help 1%, 10%, 90%? Are there any, are there, is there any research that puts it into numbers? Metric. Um, yes, um, and, and to your point, Looking at an entire watershed, if we take a look at the Wissahickon Creek watershed, you know, hundreds of acres, square miles of watershed, 
you know, one rain garden, one rain barrel is not going to impact anything. If we look at the area um, around Carlisle Road, this, this watershed that we've been talking about that drains the Carlisle, one rain garden, you know, one rain barrel is not going to have a measurable impact. What we talk about is the cumulative effect of a community working together where there would be more than one rain barrel. Maybe there's 30 rain barrels, maybe there's 30 rain gardens, maybe there's an acre or two of lawn that is converted to meadow. Now you can start having some measurable effect on that runoff. And so we have these computer models. And when we talk about one of the input computer model is the size of the watershed. Another input is the amount of rainfall that we expect in any given storm. And the third input is what kind of surface condition are we dealing with and what kind of soils exist under that surface condition. And so certainly the, the, the curve that we insert into the computer model for a parking lot is like a 98. Everything's running off, nothing's being absorbed. When you look at you know, a turf lawn, um, maintain grasses, you know, probably a 65%, you know, curve number in this computer model. If you look at a meadow condition or a forested condition, that number drops again. Put into our computer models, different types of cover and generate, you know, then a reduction in, in the, the theoretical rate of runoff. Uh, and again, it all depends on the size of the watershed we're capturing the amount of water we can store, uh, and, and then the amount of impact that we can have. Again, rain gardens, if, you know, if there's an opportunity where there's kind of a low spot in your yard and you don't mind a more naturalized area, rain gardens can cumulatively cause improvement. So again, yeah, all these things kind of working together are worth, are worth pursuing. So how do you look to them? Well, depends. It depends on the underlying soils. So certainly if you're in South Jersey and you've got a, uh, you know, a very sandy condition, you build a rain garden, there's going to be a lot of infiltration and there's going to be a lot less runoff due to that sandy, loamy soil condition. If you're in Eastern Montgomery County and you've got a lot of clay content in your soil and the infiltration rates are fairly low, then you know, you're know you not impacting the total volume of runoff as much. But you know, again, if you've got a 30 by 30 kind of area, that's a rain garden that's four feet deep, and that amount of runoff is removed from the watershed. Yeah, again, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but and we're not, we don't typically talk about stormwater in terms of gallons. We talk about cubic feet. You know, gallons are a pretty small measure for large flows. But if we can create a rain garden that has, you know, 200 cubic feet of storage, you know, again, in a large watershed, 200 cubic feet is nothing. I think over at Sandy Run, we're talking about 50 or 60,000 cubic feet of storage that we're, you know, creating. And so then you start talking about, you know, some measurable improvement. But again, individual rain gardens, you know, Again, overall impact on the watershed, not measurable, but collectively, cumulatively, if we can get more and more people involved, then I think there is some ability to have some impact. But, but Tim, if you're having a rain garden installed professionally, the, the professional should be able to give you some idea oh, sure. of how much Collect. Yep. Yeah, Peter. Looking to, at the soil. And looking at the yeah. And and so, yeah. soil yeah. And to, to Tim's soil. point, it's very subjective. Like if you get a specific project that you know the soils, you know what plants you're going to put in, you know how deep you're going to do it. Absolutely. They can give you a specific number to Chris's point. Um, you know, not an apple to apple comparison. Uh, but, you know, earlier I mentioned Mermaid Park and the stream bank stabilization stuff there since it's our project and we know the specifics and we know the linear feet, which was 190 linear feet of stream bank stabilization, we know, and we did the calculation, you know, by doing that 190 square feet of stabilization, we're gonna be preventing, uh, I think it was like about 5,000 cubic uh, feet of sediment 
on an annual basis. So that's 5,000 every single year that we're stopping from going into the, into the pond. So, you know, when you have the project in mind and you have the specifics, you can absolutely, you know, calculate those, those benefits. Okay. So what about pesticides? Um, like a lot of people in our neighborhoods put pesticides on their lawns or spray yep. for mosquitoes yep. and things like that. I mean, does that have an effect on like the run? and the pollutants, things yeah, like that. You know, and, and I guess the absolutely very good question. And so, you know, one of the components that we're trying to deal with is water quality. And one of the things that is a negative to water quality are the fertilizers and pesticides and those things that would be carried away by, by runoff. And so rain gardens and naturalized detention basins do have an ability to filter that out. And, and so, yes, that one of the components we always talk about is, you know, what can we do to help improve the quality of the receiving waters, in this case, the Wissahick and Creek. Um, and filtration through dense vegetation is a very good technique to do that. Sure. So it, when you talk about um, vegetation, for example, in the world of, um, well, they're called trophic levels. And that's the amount of life basically that is in the soil below us. So everybody knows a tree is up here. We see all that. Below ground, a healthy tree has all of that. All of the vegetation that you put is absorbing the water that goes in. And uh, turf grass, you know, roots that deep. Uh, the taller, the, the higher up the grass grows, the deeper its roots. So the more, um, the better the planting, the more rainwater it's gonna hold. And there are, in Europe, there are many places where they have planting rules and regulations and the type of things, and the trees just soak up the rainwater and they've improved so much of what they're dealing with there. So it's, it's not just a rain garden that's taking the water and letting it keep there, it's also Indeed. And, and, you know, there are other things that the township can do. And Tim, if you want to go to the, to the next slide, um, you know, to kind of tackle the next two slides and kind of take us into home, uh, you know, uh, Hemlock Road, uh, the township, as Commissioner Wilson uh, referenced earlier, uh, back in what, like ten years ago, a little bit, at least ten years ago. Uh, you know, there were there was a neighborhood on Hemlock Grove uh, that you know about twelve houses consistently flooding, not a little flooding, like flooding, like exclamation point okay. underline, you know, flooding, right? And so you know, again, this is another you know. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, uh, offers a, a flood hazard mitigation buyout program where the township secured these federal funds and bought the properties. You know, the money did go to the homeowners to, you know, unfortunately, you know, live in another home uh, as painful as it was, you know, chances are, you know, they didn't want to live in a house that consistently was underwater. Uh, so the township did buy the homes once the everyone kind of moved out, the homes were demolished, and now it is full Genetti Park. It is open green space. There's no nothing there other than trees, wildlife, yep. and plants, w with the understanding that it's going to flood, and that you know it's better to flood a natural area so that it can help filter that off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to get up. Yeah. Oh, All right. Uh, so here, uh, what is the the homeowner? Situation that they don't want to it's a voluntary program. It is voluntary. Yep. So, you know, they can choose to continue. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, my understanding is that they would have lost the flood insurance uh, just because they were just so impacted so often that, you know, the. Well, yeah. 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 So, exactly. <laughs> you know, these people constantly had their first floor. Underwater, 
Yeah. So, you know, and so going, going back to those sins of the past, when we take a look at that floodplain map, we can see the number of properties that were inadvertently built in high risk areas. <clears throat> and if we're talking about how to solve flooding problems, we would probably buy hundreds of homes, remove hundreds of homes yeah. from our, you know, not these which we aren't doing, but entering suburbs. Uh, and return those areas to natural floodplains with overbank areas that can accept the water without damage. We would be building more infrastructure. We're building more basins. So the ultimate solution is out there, but it's you know very disruptive and billions of dollars later. And you know, so what do we do in the meantime? Tim, do you know whether FEMA still has that repetitive high, you know, high incident? Yeah, program? they do. So. Yeah. Okay. When, because uh, I, I kind of helped oversee the a lot of the damages that were, you know, Ida related, um, just, you know, nature of the job. Uh, you know, FEMA does keep records of, you know, what properties submitted a claim yeah, during the, what and I incidents. think too, isn't it though, it's kind of storm based. So there's a storm and then FEMA identifies, you know, hazard mitigation monies that go to Montgomery County or go to the state. To be distributed to Montgomery yeah. County. Um, this, here's, you know, $18 million. And you, this is hazard mitigation money uh, that can be spent for properties that were adversely impacted. So yeah, the program is ongoing, but I think it is storm specific. I can't remember which storm it was for Hemlock, but it was one of the storms where there was a federal disaster declaration, similar to what we went through with Ida, where, you know, the governor and the president all said, this is a disaster, you know, the storm was a disaster, and it kind of started the, the mechanism. Was it? I can't remember the name. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's very event-based, event yeah. being nature of specific storms. Uh, I know through manager friends of mine, uh, you know, with Ida, there's a lot of buyout money coming uh, to Bridgeport and Norristown and those along the Schuylkill that kind of made the news. And you saw, you know, unfortunately, you know, half their towns were underwater. Um, are they buying half the town? Absolutely not. Uh, but they have identified those that are, you know, let's say repeat customers uh, who, you know, consistently flooded in 99, consistently flooded in 2010, consistently flooded you know, in 2021. And they're like, these properties are always on the hit list. You know, rather than delving money out to restore these homes, the federal government, mind you, this is not the locals, the federal governments are saying, you should consider a, a buyout of these homes and we'll give you the money to do that. Yes. Is there any, any thought to uh, widening that creek bed there at Hemlock Bird to reduce the volume going downstream further? Uh, not at this point, but it's absolutely, you know, I love ideas. So, yeah. you know, it's always something that we can always the think about. The, 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 there's a sewer collector pipe yeah. that parallels that creek. So that, that would be very difficult to widen at that whole path there, in the park. But there are things that could be done at, like, let's say, full, full Genetti Park. So all, the, all the water from Hall Lane, Wedgwood, Green Hill. Yeah all come down that, that dry uh, ditch down there, and then that all collects there, and then from there down to East Mill Road, yeah. it, gets so, it gets so high so quickly, and then that's a back up in the R, R section up there. And if they could reduce the volume, that would help alleviate the bar problem. No, and then that would also keep the East Mill Road Bridge uh, down between Poplar uh, uh, and Hemlock Noted. Yeah. I'll make so you're that. following up on, on that, Ron. So the, a couple of things that, that we are looking at as solutions. So getting properties out of the floodplain and then to your point, improving those areas as best we can. The more overbank storage we have, the less water that's running downstream, all of those things are good. One of the other things that we were talking about is removal of excess impervious cover. I just took a picture of the shopping center just for, as an example. But if there are areas around town where there are large areas of impervious cover that are underutilized or no longer necessary, in my favorite example, some of these old Kmart parking lots, 
you know, for whatever reason, you know, the old Kmarts, they had hundreds and hundreds of parking spaces that were not even on Christmas Eve were utilized. And, you know, just removing excess paving, the excess parking, converting that to a meadow condition would be another technique that we could look at to help make up for some of those sins of the past and things that we can, we can do. So again, all these techniques that we have in our kind of bag of tricks are things that we were talking about going back to our, our goals. And so Brandon was describing some of the things that are happening, our, our Carlisle Road project, our Burton Road project, um, others that we are looking at uh, down on integrity. There's an opportunity to create a more regional kind of detention basin off of integrity. We've been working with some of the property owners in that area to talk about the township's ability to gain an easement to build a basin uh, that again, wouldn't solve problems, but it would be a sufficiently large area that we could have a measurable effect on runoff. And, and Paul, one of the things that we've been talking about on that integrity row basin is a more naturalized basin where we would have you know, plant material that would take runoff from Tankar. And so if there are remaining, um, it would be an opportunity to remove those pollutants through that filtration system, the natural vegetated filtration system on Tegrita Road. It's another spot. We talked about over a Sky Drive. There is an old style basin over on Sky that does, it's, it's a large area, but does, could be improved to make that a more modernized basin with some filtration. We could expand storage. We could modify an outlet structure. Again, that captures a fairly large area that ends up going down to Brookside. And so looking higher in the watershed uh, for areas where we can create some mitigation and improve downstream properties are, are good ones. We've talked about grant applications. B did a grant application to improve some storm sore off of Montgomery, uh, extend storm sores into areas that don't have storm sore today. Uh, that would again, help clean up and, and convey water to where it's supposed to be rather than through people's people's yards. So again, a, a lot of opportunities, a lot of complications, but uh, certainly worth conversation. And so I thought that perhaps it would be a good time. Again, our goal is that beautiful riparian Carter natural mountain stream. Uh, and how do we get there, uh, I guess, is our goal. And certainly, I think it's a good opportunity to further these conversations and questions certainly available. And, and I know for people who might be watching and for those in the audience, I know you're getting tired of me saying that, but uh, a lot of these projects that are kind of displayed up here and kind of we've referenced uh, minimal impact on the, the township's budget or your tax dollars. Uh, that's at least part of my goal is to lessen the burden of what comes out of you know, our collective pocket uh, and a lot of these stormwater projects, uh, you know, through the support and the direction of the Board of Commissioners uh, are being funded by uh, federal dollars that the township has received uh, in response to the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, so this isn't money coming from the budget. This isn't money coming from our capital reserve. Uh, this is money that uh, the U.S. Treasury gave to every municipality uh, throughout the nation. Uh, it's kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Uh, based, on population. based on population, based on their form, their super secret formulas, uh, you know, yeah, 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 indirectly, indirectly, you know, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, but uh, a lot of these projects are being funded through those federal dollars. So I know some people might be seeing, well, you're planning to do this, you're planning to do that, you're talking about Burton Road, you talk about Mermaid Park, you know, why are my taxes going up? And Got to do my government thing. We Springfield Township has only raised taxes once in the last five years, uh, and that was in 2021. Uh, so, you know, just putting that out there because uh, that's part of my job, too. Uh, but a lot of these projects are being funded not through the township's coffers, but through state, county, and federal uh, wallets, so to speak. So, uh, just let that ease any concerns that anyone might have. So with that, you know, we're more than welcome to answer any questions that you'd like to have recorded on the video. Uh, again, this video 
will be posted on the website so you can share it with your friends and tell them how awesome it was. Uh, you know, we're, we are doing this uh, in response to the commissioner's efforts uh, to educate the public and offer these type of uh, informative uh, workshops. Last year was an, our inaugural one uh, on land development. This is our second attempt at it, uh, stormwater. Uh, and, you know, this is something that at least the Board of Commissioners would like to continue moving forward at least once a year, offering some kind of edu educational workshop, different topics to kind of inform the public so that when we're up here, you know, Monday nights, Wednesday nights talking about stuff, you know, that it gives you, allows you to have more of an informed input and feedback, which is, you know, ultimately the government, uh, the job of government. So with that, any questions? Yes, Chris. Uh, the lead-in dealt with uh, the concept of, well, this is watershed, this is where water comes from, i.e. we want to drink clean water. What can you tell us about PFAS in the township, in the water system where we all get our uh, water from? I heard, and this could be wrong information, that the North Hills uh, well was stopped uh, because of some concerns I, that may be wrong. What can you tell us? What is all that you can tell us about PFAS? I, I'm not sure that I too much about, you know, groundwater contamination in the water supply. Um, certainly it is a topic of conversation. You know, uh, EPA has continued to evolve what are safe drinking water standards and as new chemical compounds are found to be carcinogens or issues, I know those EPA changes are being made. Mm -hmm. At the township level, we don't really deal with drinking water because we're part of Aqua Pennsylvania service area. And so it's really the water suppliers who have to deal more with those water quality standards than we do at the local government level. Um, and certainly some of those deep issues, um, in well water and, you know, the contaminants that come from hydrocarbons and whatever else, you know, we've used land for in the past, aren't typically adversely impacted by stormwater runoff. The stormwater runoff is typically a very shallow condition. You know, what's coming off a road, what's coming off of a lawn, uh, and, and what's going into the stream kind of on an immediate basis. You know, the, the deeper problems, we don't have a whole lot of information about. Do you have anything be that... No, but I know this is something that's on the, the township's environmental advisory commission's radar. Uh, so I know you, you're an honorary member, Chris, from your dedication to attending our meetings. Uh, they meet on the fourth Wednesday of every month. Uh, you know, I welcome you to send them an email through me. You know, so email me, uh, and you know, I'm I'm sure that they're more than happy to kind of raise the topic. And you know, they bring in presenters every month, uh, almost every month. So I'm sure that they would be more than welcome to engage that in that conversation. And, and maybe somebody from Aqua would be a good person yeah, to- Aqua does have a very, yeah. very good uh, website where, they, where you can you know, scroll down and almost put your address in and they can tell you where you get your water from and, and what levels of, you know, what, what's in your water. And uh, to my knowledge, Springfield has fortunately isolated itself pretty successfully from most of the word in Springfield comes from the well behind the fire and fire. Yeah. I Which ventured is... into that. I just got the impression there's <laughs> water sanitization uh, of water. information before a couple sides, but yeah. wanted to find out what. Yeah. Water related. Great, everyone. Oh, great. Well, yeah, we're going to end the recording now. So thank you for joining us today. Yes, you know, Tim you. and I are going to be around taking things up. If you have questions, feel free to you know, stop on up. And uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to contact the Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you.